The major components of the clutch brake valve are the clutch signal spools, one for each side of the steering unit, the foot brake spool, and the metering spool. The heavy springs around the clutch signal spools hold the spool in the clutch apply position, and the spring around the foot brake spool holds it in the released position. The clutch signal spools control the movement of the metering spools located directly behind them. The metering spool controls the flow of oil leaving the valve. When the steering levers are in a drive position, the clutch signal spools, along with the high pressure oil in the valve, keep the spring-loaded metering spools seated against the valve body cover. In this position, the metering spool allows oil flow from the clutch brake valve to flow to the high-low valve. The signal spool is pulled forward against its spring, allowing the spring behind the metering spool to move it forward, thus stopping oil flow to the high-low valve. When the oil flow is cut off, the drive clutch disengages and the spring applied brake engages. When the foot brake is applied, the foot brake spool is pulled forward, blocking off flow to the brake. The springs will then apply the brake. The clutch brake valve also incorporates a tow port located in the valve housing. Since the brake is spring applied and hydraulically released, the machine would be immobilized if there were a hydraulic or engine failure. However, by removing the plug shown in the picture and installing a grease fitting in its place, a grease gun can be used to charge the brake circuit, thus releasing the brakes. The grease in the brake circuit will then dissipate when the hydraulic system is again in operation. A fiber or Teflon impregnated grease will contaminate the hydraulic system. Therefore, use only a multi-purpose grade grease in the tow port. The high-low valve contains two spools, one for each side of the steering unit. The spools receive oil flow from the corresponding metering spools located in the clutch brake valve. When the spool is pulled out, oil flow is directed to the high-range clutch. A hydraulic spring and ball-type detent holds the spool in this position until the steering lever is manually moved back to the low-range position. The heavy spring around the spool holds it in the low-range position. Shown in this illustration is the oil flow through one side of the steering valves. The clutch brake valve is in the drive position, and the high-low valve is in the low-range position. Oil from the pump is divided to charge the signal spool and metering spool of the clutch brake valve. The oil flow passes through the center of the signal spool and moves the metering spool back against spring pressure to allow a free flow of oil through the metering spool to the high-low valve. In the high-low valve, flow is divided into clutch apply pressure and brake release pressure. Since the valve spool is in the low-range position, High-pressure oil is directed out the forward port to be directed to the low-range clutch. This position of the spool also opens a return port for the oil coming back from the high-range clutch. Oil flow for brake release only uses the high-low valve as a manifold, so the position of the spool has no effect on brake operation. This schematic 
represents the left-hand side of the steering hydraulic system when the tractor is in low-range drive. Before entering the steering valve spools, oil flow from the pump is directed to the junction manifold where it moves the spool within the manifold over to one side. We'll discuss the function of the junction manifold spool later in the program. Let's first trace the clutch apply pressure. This line is illustrated with cross hatching marks for easy identification. From the low range port of the high low valve, the oil travels to the junction manifold where it flows around the spool and is directed to the low range clutch in the steering unit. Oil pressure for brake release leaves the metering spool of the clutch brake valve and then travels around the foot brake spool where it is directed through the junction manifold housing and on to the brake in the steering unit. When the foot brake is applied, the foot brake spool is pulled out. In this position, brake release pressure from the metering spools flows around the foot brake spool and is directed to the return passage in the valve housing. Pressure in the brake assembly is also open to return by the position of the spool. The brakes are now applied by spring tension. Both brake return lines are interconnected at the spool. This is illustrated by the loop in the schematic. Because of this connection, the return pressure in both lines is equal thus providing even braking. As can be seen in the schematic, oil is still allowed to energize the drive clutches. In this situation, torque in the drivetrain is absorbed by the torque converter. This schematic illustrates the complete steering system oil flow when the tractor is in a gradual left turn. In this situation, the high range clutch is engaged on the right side of the steering unit and the low range clutch is engaged on the left side. Again, for easy identification, the clutch apply pressure flow is illustrated with cross hatching marks. Starting at the top of the illustration, Oil from the pump is directed to the steering valves where it is separated into flow to the signal spools and flow to the metering spools. The metering spools direct oil to their respective high-low spools. The high-low spools divide the incoming oil, sending one portion to the foot brake spool from which it is sent to the steering unit for brake release. The remaining oil flow is for clutch application. The left hand high low spool is in the high range position and directs the oil flow directly to the right hand high range clutch. It was mentioned earlier in the program that the clutch brake steering valve incorporates a towing feature that makes it possible to release the brakes when the hydraulic system is inoperative. Let's follow this schematic and see how this is done. Since there is no flow from the pump, the spool and the junction manifold is seated in its bore by the spring behind it. Let's trace the path the grease will take when it is pumped into the valve. As it enters the tow port, the grease travels through a check valve and travels as far as a second check valve which prevents backflow into the pump outlet line. The grease now enters the metering spools where it is divided. Grease following the clutch apply path, illustrated with cross hatching, is stopped at the junction manifold spool. This prevents the drive clutch from being applied. The other portion of grease travels around the foot brake spool and on to the steering unit to release the brake clutch.
We'll stop momentarily now and review the hydraulic control system before going any further in the program. Stop the tape, please, while you are answering the questions. Here are the answers to the first question. One is the metering spool. Two is the signal spool. And three is the foot brake spool. The answer to the second question. A hydraulic detent holds the high-low valve spool in the high speed range. Number three is false. The drive clutches are still pressurized when the foot brake is applied. Number four is true. The metering spool controls the oil flow, leaving the clutch brake valve. Number five is false. The grease used to release the brake will dissipate when the tractor is put back into operation. Methods used to diagnose steering system malfunctions will now be discussed. Remember, proper problem diagnosis is the process of determining which system component has failed by performing a series of logical checks and tests, not by replacing parts until the malfunction is corrected. The following frames will illustrate the more probable problem areas to be checked when diagnosing the steering system. The checks do not necessarily have to be performed in the order shown in this program. Check the hydraulic oil level. A low level can cause overheating or may allow air to be drawn into the hydraulic pump. It is also necessary to use the proper grade of oil in the system. This steering system has been designed to operate with certain grades of oil. To differ from this can very well cause operational problems. Check the condition of the suction strainer and oil filters. A restricted suction strainer can starve the pump. Clogged oil filters will allow contaminated oil to be circulated through the system, which can cause close-fitting moving parts to seize or leak. Check for collapsed hoses or tubes. A restriction on the inlet side of the pump will cause pump cavitation. If a restriction in the system is on the outlet side of the pump, it may cause the pump to operate under constant pressure. This will cause excessive heat and engine overload. Do not neglect to check for a clogged oil cooler. Is the steering control valve linkage properly adjusted? When actuated, the control spool may not be moving to the correct position. Also check for binding linkage. Refer to your service manual for adjustment procedures. A steering complaint may not be the fault of the steering system at all. Check the track chain. It may need to be adjusted. Also check the rollers to be sure they have not seized or are damaged. Excessive buildup of hardened mud or clay can cause slow track movement. If after performing the preliminary checks we have just discussed, the cause of the steering complaint has not been found, it is recommended that hydraulic pressure tests be made. Since the steering unit is part of the drive train, a steering complaint may be the fault of the transmission. The easiest way to decide which system is the problem area and then which component has failed is to perform the following series of hydraulic pressure tests. The first test to be performed is main system pressure. This test is made at the regulator valve on the transmission. Install a test gauge in the port called out in this illustration and operate the engine at high idle. 
The pressure reading should be 260 to 280 PSI. If this pressure cannot be achieved, a worn pump or restriction on the suction side is indicated. Shown in this picture are the steering valves. Install a test gauge in each of the ports called out. Port B is for brake, C is for clutch, and T is the tow port. The brake and clutch ports shown on the left are for the left side of the steering unit. Operate the engine at high idle and record the pressure readings of all the gauges in both high and low range. These pressures should be no less than 5 psi below the main system pressure found at the regulator valve. A low reading on all of the gauges would indicate internal leakage within the steering valves. One low gauge reading would indicate an internal leak in the affected clutch pack or its supply line. Now, slowly move each steering lever through the two drive positions and the brake position. The pressure drops from one position to another should be gradual with the lever movement. If the pressure drop is not gradual, the metering spool is not functioning properly. When the control lever is in the brake position, the drive and brake clutch pressure should be zero. If the clutch packs retain a pressure, the metering spool is not moving far enough to close off oil flow to the steering unit. The final test is to slowly apply the foot brake with the steering levers in a drive position. Both right and left brake gauges should drop equally. If not, check the brake spool and the ball checks in the steering valve for contamination or a broken spring. If the steering system pressure tests indicate no problems, the transmission system should then be tested. The TD25E tractor is equipped with the same final drive assemblies as the TD25C. This is a double reduction type driven directly off of the steering unit. The remainder of the program deals with the operation and construction of the final drive assemblies. Highlighted in the illustration are the three major gears in the final drive assembly. Power is transmitted from the steering unit by the pinion shaft. The pinion shaft drives the pinion gear, which drives the bull gear. This produces the first gear reduction in the final drive assembly. As the bull gear rotates, the planet gears are driven producing the second gear reduction. Each gear reduction results in increased torque. The easiest way to understand how the final drives operate is to build one. In the next few frames, we'll build up the gear portion of a final drive, starting with the pivot shaft. The pivot shaft is rigidly mounted in the tractor frame to support the weight of the final drive components. The next components in line are the pinion and bull gear. The pinion gear is splined to the pinion shaft and the bull gear is supported by two tapered roller bearings on the pivot shaft. Also part of the bull gear is the sun gear, which drives the planet gears. The final drivetrain gear reduction is produced at the carrier. The three planet gears rotate on their own shafts 
which are secured in the carrier. As the sun gear rotates, it drives the planet gears, causing them to walk around the stationary ring gear. This motion forces the carrier to rotate, driving the sprocket. The final drive component parts are lubricated in an oil bath. The oil is circulated by a positive displacement type pump, which is driven by the pinion shaft. Each final drive assembly has its own pump. Oil is drawn through a suction tube in the final drive housing and is pumped through a filter, shown on the right. It is then returned to the final drive where it is splashed over the component parts. Each final drive has its own filter, which is located under the operator's seat. This concludes the program on the TD-25E steering system and final drives. Other programs have been developed and are available covering the TD-25E crawler tractor.